I'm sitting down with Dr. Kamara Jones, my colleague at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Why do you think that racism is important for public health professionals? Well, right now we have a national commitment to eliminating racial and ethnic disparities in health by the year 2010. But it's not like in 1998 when President Clinton and, and Dr. Satcher announced this initiative that that was the first time people noticed that there were racial disparities. Public health people have known about these disparities and been trying to address them for decades. But I think that we haven't been successful because we've just been, our approaches have been sort of pruning at the edges. And I think that if we're really going to be successful at eliminating racial and ethnic disparities, we need to deal with the fundamental causes. And it's my analysis that racism is one of the fundamental causes of racial disparities in health outcomes. I think we're going to have to think more broadly than just intervening uh, in medical care. We have to think more broadly than just our public health strategies. We need to think about other factors. We need to think about systems and changing the way that systems impact on people, the way that opportunity is structured in this country. We need to think very broadly about how this how living this country is producing these, these differences if we're going to be successful in eliminating them. You talk about multiple levels of racism. Can you explain these three levels? I do think about racism and talk about racism on three levels. And I do that because, first of all, it helps us to try to figure out, well, how could racism be operating here? How could racism be impacting blood pressure? You know? And it also helps us to think about how will we intervene? So the three levels of racism that I describe are institutionalized racism, personally mediated racism, and internalized racism. So I'm going to briefly define each of those levels for you and give you some examples of how, I, how they impact on health. Institutionalized racism, my brief definition is differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. And this kind of racism is the kind of racism that is often manifest as an inherited disadvantage. It's institutionalized in our norms, in our customs, in our laws. And it's often invisible to people because it's not that you can, there's no identifiable perpetrator. You can't say this person did something if somebody was born into poverty. It's manifest in terms of material conditions and in terms of access to power. So examples of material conditions are differential access to quality education or sound housing or job opportunities or equal income for the same job, differential access to health care and health care facilities. So when people ask me, are you talking about racism or socioeconomic status, I say that institutionalized racism explains the fact that there is an association between race and socioeconomic status in this country. And that's a very, very important point. The other thing before I go into the other levels of racism that I'd like to say about institutionalized racism is that it can be through acts of commission or acts of omission, and very often institutionalized racism is manifest as inaction in the face of need. For personally mediated racism, my quick definition is differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So that's what most people think of when they hear racism. Somebody did something to somebody. Um, it is, in fact, the prejudice, the different idea, and the discrimination, the different action. Now, how could that impact on your health? Well, certainly uh, police brutality impacts on people's health. But you also have examples of, uh, within the healthcare system, physician, what I call physician disrespect, which could be as subtle as a physician feeling that a patient couldn't understand certain directions or wouldn't comply or couldn't afford or wouldn't be interested in certain treatments. Or it could be as blatant as sterilization abuse. On personally mediated racism, other examples of teacher devaluation. Um, a, phys a teacher looking at a young child and figuring that that child uh, can't learn or interpreting that child's questions at a low level of sophistication as opposed to a higher level of sophistication and sort of tracking that child in a whole wrong trajectory that's not going to let them realize their full potential. So there are many, many examples of disrespect when you go shopping, all of that. It's all of the things that are part of everyday racism, I think, add to our stress and directly or indirectly impact our health. What I'd like to say about personally mediated racism is that like institutionalized racism, it can be through acts of commission, doing, as well as acts of omission, not doing. But also it's very, very important to realize that personally mediated racism 
can be unintentional as well as intentional. People do not have to mean to have been racist to have a racist outcome. Moving on to the third level of racism that I described, internalized racism, my quick definition of that is acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. So that is the kind of racism that uh, manifests in terms of helplessness and hopelessness um, and self-devaluation, self-devaluation, feeling that you really can't uh, do or you shouldn't aspire to be a physician or a teacher or whatever, that maybe that's not for you. And uh, of course, personally mediated racism gets in there too when you advise that, but when you internalize those messages and don't try anymore. I talk about this syndrome called the white man's Isis Colder syndrome as part of internalized racism. And what do I mean by that? Well, that expression comes from my parents' generation. If you were black and you needed a lawyer, you might pick a white lawyer over a black lawyer. Or if you needed a doctor, you might pick a white doctor over a black doctor. In fact, if you needed ice, you might go and buy the white man's ice over the black man's ice because the white man's ice is colder. You have deeply internalized that white is superior. In terms of the helplessness and hopelessness, I think that turns into a lot of our self-destructive health behaviors. So I would just kind of summarize internalized racism by saying that it's accepting the limitations of the box into which we've been put. Accepting that there are certain white ways to be, for example, and black ways to be, or Latino ways to be. Accepting that uh, black folks don't play violin or do ballet, you know, whatever the stereotypes are. Or that if you're trying to, if you're smart and trying to achieve in school that you're acting white. Since when did white people claim that? So those are the three levels of racism that I describe. And I think that when we're asking ourselves in a public health setting, how could racism be causing you know, higher rates of diabetes? We can think about, well, how, how could that be happening on the level of institutionalized racism? How could it be happening on the level of personally mediated racism? And how could it be happening in terms of internalized racism? And that will guide us, first of all, if we're researchers, in the kinds of questions we might want to ask. But when we're also trying to be interventionists, it will guide us in where we need to intervene. I've heard you use a story to illustrate these three levels of racism. I believe that you call it the gardener's tale. It's a very powerful story. Can you share it with us? This story, which I call Levels of Racism, a gardener's tale, actually like most of the stories that I tell, I've developed quite a few allegories for understanding race and racism, and like most of them, comes from one of my own personal experiences. This gardener has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil, and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, impatience, let's say, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms, and some is going to produce red blossoms. And the gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed and she puts it in the rich fertile soil. And she takes the pink seed and she throws it into the poor rocky soil. And in three weeks in her garden, the same thing happens that I saw in my garden. All of the red flowers, you know, not only sprout, but they're flourishing and growing up. Even the weak seed of the red makes it to a middling height. But in the poor rocky soil, the weak seed died. And even the strongest seed was struggling, struggling, struggling to make that same middling height. And then in those boxes, those flowers go to seed and drop the seed in the same soil. And then the next year, the same thing happens, and those flowers go to seed. And year after year, the same thing happens. And so finally the gardener, two years later, is looking at her garden, and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. Now, I'm going to stop the story there to say that this first part of the story has been about institutionalized racism. You had the initial historical insult of the separation of the seed into different kinds of soil. And then you had, through acts of omission, not attending to this, the perpetuation of this situation. And you even had the contemporary structural factors, the flower boxes, keeping the soil separate. Now you might ask, well, where would personally mediated racism be in this garden? Well, that would be when the gardener is looking at the flowers and she looks over at the red and says, oh, how beautiful, and looks over at the pink and says, oh, how scrawny, and she plucks the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or she notices that a pink seed has been blown into the rich, fertile soil, and she plucks it out before it can establish itself. And then you say, well, where is internalized racism in this garden? Well, that's where the pink flowers are struggling, and, you know, they're, they're in their box, and they're looking over at the red. The red is just all, you know, 
flourishing and haughty even <laughs> about it. <laughs> and the pink flowers see a bee coming in and out, you know, collecting pollen, or actually collecting nectar, but pollinating in the meantime. And so it's over in the red flowers, and it comes over, and it dips into a pink flower, and then it comes over, and this next pink flower says, stop, bee, don't bring me any of the pink pollen. I prefer the red, because the pink flowers have internalized that red is better than pink. They're looking over there, and it looks that way. So the question arises, what do you do to set things right in this garden? Well, you could start by addressing the internalized racism. So you could go over and you could talk to the pink flowers and you could say, you know, power to the pink. Pink is beautiful. And that might make them feel better, but that in and of itself will not change the condition in which they're living. Or you could say, no, no, we're not going to deal with the internalized racism. Let's deal with the personally mediated racism. So you might go over and talk to the gardener. Or you might even, you know, let's not just talk to her. Let's hold a, a workplace, you know, multicultural workshop for the gardener and you say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink blossoms? And maybe she will, maybe she won't. But even if she does, that's not going to change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. What you really have to do if you want to set things right in this garden is address the institutionalized racism. So you either have to break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, which is okay too, I guess, although it makes it much easier to segregate resources. I think, but if you want to do that, then you enrich the poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. It's interesting, they may even do, they may look better than the red flowers because they've been selected for survival and strength, which is an interesting notion. But when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. And when they flourish, then you'll have also addressed the internalized racism because they'll no longer be looking over at red, wanting to be red or thinking red is better because they'll see how beautiful they are. And you might even, over time, address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the, the two pots you know, equally beautiful would be less likely to adopt those kinds of attitudes. What if the gardener really thought that pink was inferior to red? And this is when we get into the whole notion of biologic determinism, right? What if she thought that the pink seed was weaker than the red? She wouldn't even ask the question, what can I do to set things right in the garden? Because she would think that there was no other way it could be. I raise this because so much of our, when we as scientists and as public health practitioners document race-associated differences, which is important, but if we do that without digging more deeply to see what is causing these race-associated differences, then we are contributing to ideas of biological determinism. And I think that we have to recognize as scientists that, yes, we must, when we see these differences, we must continue to measure things by race as long as there are racial differences, but we have to ask the deeper question, why do these differences occur and not just leave it as that. We must start asking questions, including questions about how is racism contributing here. The most important part of this story we haven't talked about yet that's to ask the question, who is the gardener? Because after all, it's the gardener who has you know, the ability to, to move, the ability to act, the ability to decide, the control of resources. And in our context in the United States, the gardener is our government. And I think it's particularly um, troublesome if the gardener has a preference for one side or the other. You know, usually I have some slides that I show and I paint the gardener red, which is why she prefers red over pink. And it's also uh, a problem if the gardener does not have a commitment to equity. That is, if the gardener doesn't care, if the gardener is so identified with the red box that it's, the gardener is not even caring what's happening in the other pink box. I mean, that's not even part of her definition of the garden, you know. I think that at least in this country now, what our initiative to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities has given us is an explicit commitment to equity and explicitly that we're going to eliminate disparities. And so that equips us to say, okay, now we have to take a look at this garden, take a look at what's happening, and try to make things right. So what this story has been about is to illustrate the three levels of racism, the institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized racism, and to further give us guidance to suggest that if we want to set things right in this garden, then we have to at least address the institutionalized racism. We can address the other levels at the same time, but we must at least address the institutionalized racism. And if we do, the other may take care of themselves. And now we understand to change the garden that we need to focus on institutionalized racism. But how do we really measure that type of racism?
Well, to start addressing institutionalized racism, I think we have to do three things. We have to uh, be brave and vocal about naming racism. I think we have to monitor data. We need to ask ourselves, could racism be here? And monitor data, sentinel data, to identify where we need to take a closer look. And then finally, we need to identify mechanisms, ask how is racism operating here. Let's talk about what CDC is doing to address racism and health disparities. Well, I guess one of the first um, things I should mention is that I am at CDC, uh, I'm, where I'm research director on social determinants of health within the Division of Adult and Community Health in our Chronic Disease Center. And in that role, I have convened the Measures of Racism Working Group, which has been meeting now uh, regularly for two years. And we have members from all of the different centers here at CDC. We have members from the Morehouse College and Morehouse School of Medicine. We have members from Emory's Rollins School of Public Health, from Fisk University's Race Relations Institute, from the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness, we, from the Association of Black Cardiologists. We have actually served as a nidus for people who have been interested in and working on these issues kind of separately for a long time. And now we are together focusing our, our brain power and our energies to help the CDC in its eliminating racial disparities work to understand the impacts of racism on health. What would you like people to take away from this discussion? With all of this, you know, definitions of racism and a story illustrating these three levels and, and talking about the importance of addressing institutionalized racism and measuring it, what are really, what do I want people to take, you know, from this message? And I think I can boil it down by saying, in the same way that I want us, first of all, to not be in denial that racism continues to exist. And in the same way that the members of the stigmatized races are kind of walking around with an awareness of racism that members of the non-stigmatized race are not, I want all of us to be acknowledging that racism exists and is having impacts on people. I want all of us to be actively naming racism in our workplaces and in our churches and in our schools and our communities. I want us to do that so that we can then ask the further question, how is racism operating here? And when we start asking that question, then we will identify things that we can change. The most important thing is that somehow we feel that we have agency to change our own individual behaviors, but that we don't have agency to change big things like racism. And I want to equip us with the language and the kind of confidence and the question so that we can start thinking, yes, I'm going to ask a question that's going to guide me to how I can change and intervene on racism here. Then we won't have to just shrug our shoulders and give up. So please, everybody who listens to this, let us name racism because it does exist. And let us go in all of our places and think and ask out loud and on paper, how is racism operating here? And then let's make a commitment to address that. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time and talking with us. It is always a pleasure to talk with you and learn more about your work. Thank you. To learn more about CDC's work, please visit our website at www.cdc.gov.